then I know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I, I know that you guys are doing what you're supposed to do. Why does it say it takes a village? Because the truth is my experiences alone aren't enough for my kids because if my kids were only around me, then they would only be exactly what I am. I could only produce in their life what I have. But you guys have stuff in your lives that I don't have that my kids might need, right? You put a kid into the, you put a seed into the ground and you got to give it water, you got to give it, and then you start fertilizing and you start putting, why? Because there's things in that ground that affect a plant differently, right? That's why if you have a citrus tree, you put it into miracle Grow citrus, right? Because you want to put them into the ground that's going to best render the results that you're looking for. So when I came to this church, one of the things I was looking for was not just a place for me to serve. It was for a place for me, my wife, and my kids to serve because I recognize there are soils that are best for certain situations. And my kids needed this place as bad as I did. They didn't know it. They didn't even exist yet. But I knew from the Father that I needed to put them into good soil. And I'm grateful for the little country church because it is exactly that. Jesus was a disciple. Jesus never fathered anybody, yet he had hundreds of disciples. Now, we talk about the 12 because they were the close ones, but there were literal hundreds of disciples of Christ. And why is it important? Because we recognize that the mantle of father isn't just siring a child, but rather seeing that thing to fruition, seeing that thing to its greatest. That's why after Jesus died, he didn't just leave because he recognized he still had some stuff he needed to put into him, right? And when we, get, when we leave this planet, we realize that, hey, you know what, that's it for us. I can't keep fathering my kids. My ideas and the things they've learned from me, that keeps going on in their minds, but I can't physically speak to them anymore. Jesus had that opportunity, and so he did. He took the opportunity to further their lives, and what is that for us? That's you guys. If I happen to pass away tomorrow, the reality is it would be on you guys to help render the children up in the way that they should go, right? And so that's what Jesus was saying. He's saying, look, I'm going away and I'm preparing a place for you. But the truth is that after I leave, the responsibility falls on you. You're going to have to raise up disciples of your own, whether you sire kids or not. And we don't really know if the disciples had kids. Peter was married. We know that. Doesn't say that he had kids or not. But the truth was it wasn't in them not to father. It was just in them to raise up the next generation, to be able to pass along the faith that was instilled by Jesus. Amen. So today, in honor of Pastor, and as much as he loves acronyms, and if you've been around this church at all, you know Pastor loves acronyms. So today I wrote my sermon strictly out of a acronym for him because I love you, Pastor, and I, I, I thought it was funny, honestly, because it's not really how I think. It's not, I don't even think that way, but Pastor does, and so I thought I was literally praying about it, and the word Father came into my mind, and I was going, yeah, I got it, Lord, Father's Day. No, 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 Father came to my mind. I said, okay, I got you. So. I'm going to spell out Father for you guys in an acronym today. First is faith, right? So one of the things that I see in America especially, right, any Western civilization, our idea of being a good dad is leaving the, as much stuff, and I'll be nice and use stuff, as much stuff as I can leave to my kids, that's my status as a dad. That's where I, oh, yeah, I'm... I left them a car, I left them a house, I left them a business. They're going to be good after I go. What good is it to gain the whole world and to lose your soul? The truth is the greatest thing we'll ever leave to our kids is not stuff. I could be poor when I die. If I left my kids my faith, then I did exactly what the Father called me to do as being a father. Why? Because that's what he was trying to instill into me, and that's what I'm to instill into my kids and the kids coming up behind me, right? Whether they be my kids, my grandkids, whomever, my neighbor kid, whoever the Lord gives me influence into, I'm to re-instill or to plant my faith into their lives so that they can fulfill that which God has on their lives, 
right? I don't care if they're called to be a doctor. My faith is still being implanted into their lives. And so Hebrews 11, 8 through 12 simply says this. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home. Never an easy thing to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land that God promised him, he lived there by faith. He was like a foreigner living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob. And so did Isaac and Jacob. Those are his offspring, right? Those are his next generation, and the generation after him was being raised up in the same faith, by the same faith, so that they could fulfill the promise of God on their lives. Who inherited the same promise. Listen, the promise that's on my life is being passed through me so that I can give my kids a greater future. Yes, leaving them is good stuff. Being able to give them stuff when I die is, is a hope. But I recognized early on that that's not the greatest thing that I could ever give my kids. The greatest thing that I can ever give my kids is the same faith that saved my life. The same thing that brought me out of the miry clay. The same thing that kept me from being this guy and made me into more like Jesus. That's what I was called to pass on to my kids. And so he said, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a kid. Though she was barren and was old, she believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead a nation with so many people that it was like the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashores. There is no way to count them. So because this one man had faith, listen, it wasn't just his faith. It was Abraham's, it was Isaac's, and it was Jacob's. Listen, with one of those pieces missing, we're not sitting here today like we're, we're sitting here, okay? The world's going to look a lot different. The other thing I want to say is rarely in Bible will you ever see or hear a third generation. Almost always a promise dies with the next generation. And I'm here to say that it's not the way it was intended to be. It was intended that the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And yet so many times because we fail to want to give up when we're supposed to, to be able to transition when we're supposed to, to be able to do the things that we're supposed to do as fathers, instead we hold on. And we're like, ah, or we hold back. And again, it's not always easy to sit down and talk to your kids like, hey, man, you know what? How, how are you doing in life? Not always easy, right, H? There, there have been times, right? And even me now, when JJ, she, she wants to learn. She's like, Daddy, what, what does this mean? Oh, well, baby, it means this. Oh, oh, okay, you know. But the truth is we got to continually share our faith. That's the thing that's going to bring the next generation and if I do it right in JJ's life, her children will see the same Jesus that's in me. And the same spirit that lives in me will be in her and will be in her children and her children and her children. Do you realize the Bible says that I want to bless you? I want to give you that promise for a thousand generations. And yet, how many times do you see a thousand generations? <laughs> yeah, we struggle in the Bible to see three generations. And God's saying, listen, I gave you this promise for a thousand generations. I'm like, dude, there ain't even been a thousand generations on the planet. And yet he said, I want to bless you to a thousand generations. Not give you stuff. Again, this is a Western theology. It's not about stuff. It's about the king. It's about the keys to the kingdom. I want to give you everything in your life that you need to be able to be a success. That's my job as a dad. My next thing is father is A, right? And just by the way, with F, I did want to put in fishing. I genuinely wanted to put F as fishing, but I didn't feel like the Lord was allowing that. So, <laughs> yeah, just side note, uh, authority, right? As a father, he's given me authority 
over my kids, over my wife. Now, that doesn't mean to exercise like a tyrant. That doesn't mean to tell them how they're going to be. That means to show them, to shepherd them, to guide them toward the things that they're bent for, toward the things that they were made for. It is my job as a father, as a dad, to listen to the Holy Spirit, maybe even more than them, so that I can guide them the way they should go. My ears have to be open as much as theirs or greater than theirs because of the responsibility that lands on my shoulders. When my daughter says, I want to be a vet, I want to be a cop, I want to... It's my job as Holy Spirit to begin to filter some of those out, right? Baby, okay, let's get you focused. Why? Because focused people are successful people. It's my job as a daddy to help focus them toward the things that God's calling them to. How do I know that? Only by sitting on my knee. Only by spending time in my prayer closet. Only by praying over them, interceding over them. That's how I begin to influence or have authority over my kids, right? It's not by, you listen to me, because we all know how that works. It, it works for about 10 minutes, and then good luck, okay? So you, that first whooping comes, and they're like, ow, okay, I didn't like that. But then after that, they're kind of like, yeah, I don't really like you, you know? And it's not that we're striving for our kids to like us, but listen, it is important that you have influence in their life. Because if you don't have influence, you don't have nothing. I promise you that. So authority, in the Greek, it's exosia, right? It means the power of authority and the right or the privilege. You see, you can't have one without the other. It is not only influence in their life, but it's the privilege to be able to do that. And if we look at it any other way, listen, I'm going to tell you a story. Yesterday, I went to the beach, right? Because Josh's birthday was this week, and he wanted to go to the beach. So daddy was like, okay, let's go to the beach. Now, when I go to the beach, I have an expectation of going to the beach, right? I want a fishing pole in my hand. That's just the reality. Look, that's the reality. Now, when you got three little kids, it, it's not a reality, okay? There's uh, sand toys in your future. There's sunscreen in your future. There's a, it's, it's not going to be what you wanted. It's about them. Okay, and the reality is in life, all of a sudden our priorities start to shift. As a single man, my life looked a lot different than as daddy man, okay? And so I go to the beach yesterday, and sure enough, man, it's been months and months and months I've been wanting to go fishing, and, and I get to the beach yesterday, and it was as still as I've ever seen the beach. And I'm going, you did this on purpose. I know you did. <laughs> It was, I had not seen the beach that still and forever. I'm going, Holy Spirit, it is so calm. The water was actually green. I'm like, Joshy, you having fun, baby? You having fun? Right? Why? Because my priorities begin to shift. The authority in my life isn't that I exercise my will, but his will. Real authority doesn't come out of my position. Real authority comes out of my place with him. And when I begin to learn that and I begin to express that authority, then all of a sudden my kids become aware of what it means to serve a father, a true father, one that's listening, one that's going after the heart of God. Romans 13.1 says this, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established, the authority that exists, have been established by God. You were not given that authority because you had a kid. You were given that authority because God put that authority in your life. And the moment you say no to that, the moment you're telling Holy Spirit, nah, I don't want that, nah. And the truth is God is calling you to that, otherwise he wouldn't have put that in your life. You are the best daddy that kid could have because Holy Spirit put it in you. Whether it's neighbor kid, whether it's grandkid, it does not matter. The reality is so as soon as Holy Spirit gives you influence into somebody's life, it's your responsibility to take that up and say, okay, I will do what it is you're calling me to do. That's what it means to be a daddy, to take responsibility for, even though it's going to cost you money, it's going to cost you time, 
It's going to make your flesh die. The things that we don't like as daddies, listen, that's exactly what he's calling you to do. Why? Because it's teaching you to come into submission the same way they come into submission to you is the same way that you come into submission of God. To the same degree, hear this, to the same degree that you are willing to submit yourself to God, and they watch because they are watching, to the same degree that you're willing to submit your life to God is the same willing they'll submit their lives to you. Now, I do realize one day they're going to become teenagers and they're going to begin to do their own thing and they're going to want to test the boundaries that you've put in their life and they're going to want to hang out with people that you don't feel like they should hang out with. And they're go- but that's why it's so important in the beginning that I establish an authority that comes from God and God alone. If I'm doing it out of my flesh, I'm going to get results out of the flesh. But if I'm doing it out of the spirit, I'm going to get results that are rendered out of the spirit. And so I pray that as dads, we continue to fall on our knees and say, God, how can I raise these kids the way you want me to raise these kids? How do I get the influence? I can tell you one way, go to other people that are doing it. Look at look at H, look at Pastor, look at all these guys that have done this for a long time. And they're both going, no, don't look at me. Don't look. But the reality is they've done it for a long time. They know what it means. They know what it's like to, to go through hard times. They know what it's like. As a young parent, I'm always asking, like, man, I don't, am I doing this right? Like, I don't know, Lord. I feel like I was a little harsh there. Or may, maybe I wasn't harsh enough, you know. And so uh, God has established examples in our lives so that we can follow them. Not only did he give himself as an example, but he's put men and above you and in your life so that you can follow the example that they've set before you and some of which you're going to say i didn't really like the way he did that you know that's the truth like i don't really like he does this maybe i'll do it a little different that's okay that's part of the example that god's put in your life so that you can see the things you want and see the things you don't want to right i had a pastor tell me one time he said david anytime you go into a sermon he said remember this he said you eat the, the meat spit out the bones there are going to be some things you hear, whether for me, pastor, wherever, TBN. You, there's some things you may, ah, doesn't really apply to me. doesn't really work for me. Okay, fine. But the truth is, truth is truth. Let truth set you free. Okay? The first understanding of authority is this. that dis, The first understanding of authority, then, is distinct from power, and it refers primarily to prerogative. Right? Prerogative. My thought. Right? My thoughts of authority, that is one of the distinct parts about authority, what I think about authority. That's a big part of authority, right? So my ability to choose, my ability to become a child of God, those are important aspects of authority, right? Because I have to choose the authorities in my life. J.J. gets to choose. She can choose to come under the authority that I am in her life, or she can choose not to, right? And every parent said amen, because there's some times that, you know what? I, well, why do I have to spank my child? That's right, I spank her. That bugs you, I'm sorry. You're going to have to forgive me. Um, I read the Bible. Um, so, <laughs> so listen, the truth is, JJ is going to have to come under the authority that I am. Otherwise, it's not doing her no good, right? She's going to have to choose to submit herself to that, okay? The second part of uh, the second concept or the second thought of authority refers to the power, the ability, the capability to complete an action. So without both of these, authority simply doesn't have its power. You have to have the spanking at the end of the submission. Otherwise, it doesn't happen, right? Otherwise, she never really fully understands as she sits here on the front row. She doesn't understand. When I say, hey, don't touch the stove, until she puts her hand on the stove and recognizes that's hot or comes under the authority that, okay, daddy said don't do that, so I shouldn't, right? One or the other is going to teach her. It's up to her, right? Now, I can grab her hand and keep her from it, and I can grab her hand and keep her from it, and I can grab. But one day, I'm going to have my back turned. I'm not going to be looking. She's going to feel the fire. It's our job not to keep our children from hardship. 
It's our job to teach them what a hardship is so that they try to avoid them for themselves. Because the truth is today, too many times you watch parents, they're like, oh no, Johnny, I'm gonna keep insulation and isolation. I can isolate you from everything in life. I didn't help you. I did not help you from anything. Instead, I insulate you. I put padding on you. I cover you in prayers. I cover you so that when life happens, and the first rock gets thrown at you, what are you, you're insulated. There's a cushion that has to be broken before it hits you, right? That's my job as a parent. That's me. It's not to keep them from every hardship they ever face. Now, I know that's not Parenting 101 in 2022, but I'm going to tell you, in the Bible, that's the reality. You saw over and over and over again, you have to learn this. Jesus said that he had to learn through obedience. If Jesus had to learn through obedience, listen, who was fully man, fully God, if he had to learn through obedience, how much more does David Clowers, who's fully man, have to learn through obedience, right? Just as my children, they have to learn through obedience, okay? So Ephesians 6, 1 through 2, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Simple. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. You're not like, maybe it's kind of gray. Look, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother for this is the first commandment with a promise. What's the promise? That your life will be long and well and it will be good with you. Listen, you want to know the worst thing that can happen to you? Dishonor your parents and your life is long and not well. Okay, <laughs> it's, a, it's not like, okay, well, I dishonor my parents, so, uh, pff, I mean, God's going to get me. No, he's saying, listen, I want your life to be long regardless of how you act. But how you act is going to determine how good it is in your life. And so honor your parents, not just, again, mom, dad, look, I, I, I say this all the time. My wife will tell you, the Bible doesn't say honor your good mother and father. It never said that. And uh, now, listen, again, America, we're like, oh, yeah, well, they were great. I can honor them. Hey, you're such a good daddy. I want to honor you, right? Well, the truth is, even if H wasn't a good daddy, that doesn't keep Travis from honoring his daddy, right? Because the Bible says, honor your mother and your father, and it will be well with you. That's a tough pill to swallow at times because, listen, I've been on the other end of it, right? When mommy and daddy didn't feel like that was a bad, I still honor my mom and dad, the ones that brought me into this world, of which one's not here and one is strung out somewhere. I still honor them because they got me here. I still honor them because they were still vessels used by God to get me to this place so that I could be in Crosby, Texas this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you used them as a vessel to get me here. Now, Lord, bless them. Help them get over themselves, right? But I still honor them. I still say yes to them only because that's what God asked me to do. Not because they were great to me and it felt good. Oh, man, they were so great. I love it. No, the truth is I do it anyway because that's what God asked me to do. And that's what obedience is. Tough love, T. Yeah, there it is. Exactly. That's a dirty word right there. Oh, man, uh, uh, I, I was writing this, and I thought, I don't even know if I want to put that in there. It was like truth. We can do, we can do real transparent. You know, we can do all these cute little words that, uh, that we love in the charismatic movement today. But the truth is, this is the greatest form of love you'll ever show your child. It's the hardest by far. I, listen, I hate this part. I do as a daddy. I never want to be able to get on my kid. My daughter's the worst. She's going to cry before I even get on to her. <laughs> nah, shh, shh. you need this. It doesn't feel good in that moment, right? That's what the Bible says. It doesn't feel good in the moment, but it's so necessary for our life. It's so necessary that our daddies took us out, as Pastor said, out to the muscadine vines. You know, my dad had to what we call the Board of Education. 
And it literally said, Board of Education. And as soon as he whooped me the first time, guess what he did? He made me sign it, right? And thank God he didn't have me sign it every time because there was not enough room on that paddle. But <laughs> I can guarantee you that there are those moments that I look back and thought, thank you, Lord, that you were willing, that my daddy was willing to spank me. Sometimes maybe he didn't do it out of the spirit. Sometimes I might have been a little frustrated, a little angry, and rightfully so. Okay. As much as I know I'm just this shining glimmer of, the shining glimmer of uh, niceness and goodness today, the truth is we needed that spanking. We needed that spanking. If I didn't get them spankings, it would have caused my life to go a different direction. Spanking, and I'm not talking about physical. Some, some kids, my wife will tell you, she was like, David, my mom didn't have to spank me. I said, well, that's good because my dad needed to spank me. I know that, 100%. My, my mom needed to spank me. Like, without those spankings, listen, I was not going to listen. There was no getting through this thick skull right here without a spanking. So, while we were children, our parents did what seemed best to them. But God is doing what is best for us. God, our parents did what was best to them. But God is always doing what's best for us. As children, he's always, because he's a good and he's a loving father, he's always doing what's best for us. At the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off big time, for it is the will trained who find themselves mature in relationship with God. It is the well trained who find themselves in a mature relationship with God. That's what we're all striving for. So don't sit around on your hands. Now, when I read this verse, I read this verse, and I read this verse, and I was sitting there, and I was thinking, you know what, God, there's got to be more. This, this second part, I don't understand it. And so I began to look in other translations, and I found it in the message, and I really loved it. It says, no more dragging your feet. This is talking to daddies right here. No more dragging your feet. Clear the path for long-distance runners so no one will trip and fall, so no one will step in a hole and sprain an ankle. Each Help each other out. Run for it. Think about that. Who's running behind us? Our kids. Why are we filling in the holes? Why are we making the path straight? Why are we so that we can leave a legacy with our children that they will far exceed what we do? Uh, me and my wife always say this. Listen, I am trying to live a life in such a way that my ceiling is my children's floor. That's it. I don't want my kids to have to strive through the same nonsense and dredge through the same nonsense that I went through as a kid right? I want my kids to be able to learn the hardships that I had to endure without having to endure them, hopefully, learning from their daddy, their mommy, in such a way that they're saying, you know what? I got a pretty good grasp on life. I got a pretty good firm hold on life. Not because I've been set up with millions of dollars and I know I'm going to be able to live the easy life, but rather so that I know that if any hardship comes my way, I'm ready to face that. That's the greatest thing you can leave with your kids, that if anything comes your way, you'll be able to give your kids the ability to withstand. That's huge. Honor. Honor is, is something that I just, I think is so important, and I feel like it's really, really been poor in America. We haven't honored our people very well. There's moments of honor. There's glimmers of honor, but our society as a whole is very independent. Our society as a whole is me, 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 and honor is always you, 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 and that's not really an easy thing to instill into the next generation because all they've seen is me, 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 and the more the news and all this social media and everything, it's even greater expense. Me, 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 right? Look at me, look at what I did, look at me, look at how I do. Oh, look at this, look at this. And the truth is, honor always points to somebody else. Always honor says, I must decrease so you can increase. I take the words right out of John the Baptist's mouth and say, man, Lord, I must decrease so that you can increase. 
not only in my life, but in my kids' life, so that they understand what honor means. Honor in the, in the Greek simply means kabod, okay? Kabod, or in, in the Hebrew, it's kabod, and it literally means heavy or weighty. When they talked about the presence of God, this is literally the word they used. It was the kabod, it was the very weighty presence of God. But what does it really, the figurative meaning, however, is far more common. It means to give weight to someone else. Simply to give weight or purpose or greaterness to you than myself. Now, this is exactly how we should live our lives as sons to the Father. This is exactly how we should live our lives as sons, daughters, to our earthly father. To give weight to to give honor to, to say, look, you know what? I realize all the things you sacrificed. I realize all the things you did that I didn't always see, right? There wasn't things that you hurt your body. You did whatever it was that you did so that my life could be where it's at. We got to give honor to that. We got to say, you know what? I give weight to you, Dad, because you deserve it. Because God put you as an authoritative figure in my life, and I honor you simply because God told me to. Out of obedience to the Father, I honor my mother and my father. Now, I'm grateful because my dad was awesome. It was real easy to give honor to my dad because he did what was right in my life. He always tried. Now, that doesn't mean he's perfect. I get it. But in my eyes, you'd be tough pressed to get me to think any other way. That's the truth. Why? Because I believe in my heart that he was always striving to be an example of God in my life. And for that, I can say I am extremely grateful. Again, more is caught than taught. More is caught than taught. Men, live your lives in such a way that your kids, grandkids, mentors, whomever is coming up behind you is catching what you're doing. Because that is what's going to change their lives. I can sit down and teach my daughter everything I want to, but if it doesn't mirror what I'm doing, it ain't going to mean much. She has to see it. We have to be men of honor in order to raise up men and women of honor. If they don't see it in me, they ain't going to be it. Now, my kids see it in me because I do everything I can to honor not only pastor, but my dad, my mom, Anybody that's in authority over me, man, I always try to go above and beyond. That's not to toot my own horn, but that is to say that I recognize that this was an extremely important aspect to life, and I was going to do everything I could to be able to enjoy that. One more page, I promise. We're going to get through this. All right. Isaiah 29, 13 says this. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouths, and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based merely on human rules that they have been taught. Listen, if we're not careful, this is the kind of honor that we're going to raise up in our kids. It's all mouth service. It's all lip service. It's all eye service. I don't want my kids in my life. This is me. You live your life the way you want to. You train your kids the way you want to. But I want honor to be such a real thing in their life. They couldn't accidentally do the wrong thing. That the only thing they've ever seen in my life was the real thing. And that there was no imitation. That I didn't do things because other people were looking. But I did things because the integrity of my heart said, this is the way I'm going to do it. And it is very easy in America today to do this. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Listen, we can get on Facebook and be like, oh, daddy, I love you. But you ain't talked to him in three months. His house leaking. Is it, you know, look, this is real life stuff. Don't get on there on Facebook and say, oh, daddy, you're the best. You're the greatest. I love you. And then you do nothing for him. Honor him. Who cares what Facebook says? Know what your heart's telling you. This is what's important for the next generation. They have to see this. And if they're not seeing it in us, they ain't seen it. Amen? Enjoy. Proverbs 23, 24. The father of a righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who sires a wise son will be glad in him. Listen, one of the best things as a daddy is that when we raise our kids up, that one day 
they're good, that they're right, that they're living the way that we trained them up to. I saw my parents, and this is just the reality. I saw my, me, me and my brother like two sides of a coin, okay? Me on one side, I wanted to do everything I could to honor my mom and dad. My brother on the other side said, I'm going to do everything I can to dishonor you. I want to do everything I can to make your life as hard as possible. And, and so I look at my parents and I say, man, the strife that they had to endure with my brother. And I, all I ever really wanted to do is, now that's not to say that I was perfect, because there was plenty of times that I was on the other side of the coin too. But once I found Christ and I said, you know what, God, I want to submit my life to him, then all of a sudden I found out what it meant to be a son. And I began to honor my parents. But a wise son that, that runs his life in righteousness will greatly, greatly bless his parents. And you will get to enjoy the reward of the tough love, of the authority, of all the things that you did in your life so that they could come up in the way that they should go. Now, like you said, <laughs> I love that you made that expression when I said tough love because that's exactly how it feels. Tough love is not fun, but what you get out of that tough love, it's worth it. It's worth it every single time. I could not have greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. This is 3 John 1 through 4. He's not talking about his children's children. He's talking about like pastor, talking about his congregation. You want to honor your pastor? Be this. I could have no greater joy than to hear my children are following the truth. That right there, when pastor gets on there and he sees that you're celebrating your grandkids and you sees that you're, that's good. That's great. But the truth is, when he gets on there and he sees that you're responding in a healthy, mature, godly way, listen, that right there does his heart good medicine, right? When I get a, when you get on Facebook and you're like, oh, God, here they go again. That's, that, you're not bringing joy and honor to your pastor, okay? That's the reality. So I want you guys to realize this. Just enjoy life. Live a life in such a way that your kids see you living well. Not, not successful in the, in the American version. Listen, that's cute. That's good. And nothing wrong with it. But don't let that thing be your God. Because if that's your God, then that's all you get to leave to your kid. Rather, make God your God. Let everything else come into subjection to that. And watch your kids flourish in the ways of the Lord. Last thing I'll leave you with is this. Repeat. Repeat. All those things I just said, keep doing them over and over and over and over until you're tired. And guess what? Keep doing it again. Why? Because I found out this. A father's work is never done. A father's work is never done. I don't care. Come tomorrow, Travis, you have a problem, who you calling? H. But here's the good thing. Here's the best part. Because Travis submitted his life to H in such a way. Now when H has a problem, guess who he gets to call? Travis, right? Why? Because that's the cycle of life, and that's the beauty of raising a kid in honor and raising a kid in the way that he should go so that one day when I'm old and it, things ain't as easy as they used to be, I got someone that got my back. I got somebody that will help me out in my old age. Right? Because if I keep listening to the men in front of me, getting old ain't for the week. <laughs> right? And so I am so grateful for the example that I see in you guys. Just want you guys to hear this. The father title never goes away. Not until I die. And even then, the reality is, just because I died, I'm not JJ's daddy anymore. Still JJ's daddy. That title lives on past me. How they live on is up to me. How they live on is because of the choices I make. Now, one day they're going to have to make their own choices. We realize that. But I can promise you I can make those choices a lot easier by the choices I make, by the things I do. That makes their choices a lot easier. That's what we're looking for. We're looking to be able to make their choices so much easier that it would be like second nature. It's like 
oh yeah, I already know what to do here. I already got the answers to the test. Because daddy lived in a way that I know, that I know how to face my life when he goes. That's the life that's successful. When I leave a legacy in such a way that my kids don't necessarily need me anymore. Now, they always going to need daddy because I'd like to think I'm awesome. At least that's what the card said this morning. Right now, out of a six-year-old's mouth, take it. Because one day I may need to hold on to those words. <laughs> but I am so grateful for the fact that I get the chance. Think about this. Think about this. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. Make the most of that privilege. Act like it's a privilege. At night, I can tell you, I'm tired. Get off the ropes cord. It's been hot all day, whatever. My kids want to hang on me. That's the last thing I promise you I want. I do not want them hanging. I'm like, I'm hot. You guys are little furnaces. Get off of me. JJ's like a stage five clinger sometimes. She will not get off of me. And I'm like, you know what? This is what she needs right now. That's fine. Daddy will lay his life aside, lay his feelings aside, lay his desires aside. Say, come on, sit in daddy's lap. I want to leave men with this. Joseph, you can come. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 is simply this. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. My God, if there's any other verse in the Bible that describes a better dad, I don't know what it is. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. When I read this verse, I thought, I could sum up being a daddy right there. How do I do that? Right there. Just do what 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Remember this, it's never too late. It's never too late. Our God is a redeeming God. It says that he can redeem the time. Maybe you've had bad relationships with your kids. Maybe you wasn't always the good father. It's never too late. Sometimes the opportunities have passed. I get it. But there are new opportunities that are waiting that God has ordained for your life because being grandpa is right around the corner. Being papa being whatever it is that God is putting into your life right now. That's what's the most important thing. I'm grateful for you guys this morning, and I just want you guys to recognize the importance of being a dad. I know I went a little long, but it was because I just felt so much in my heart about the fact that it's never too late, that there really is an opportunity for our lives to just be able to touch someone else's life, to mean more than just my singular life, that my life was meant to touch the other lives around me, that because of me, their lives are better. Taking the responsibility of being a father and making the most of it. And don't act like it's a have to. Act like it's a get to. And I promise you, the rewards of that are going to be so great. They're going to be so great. You're going to be able to eat from that tree for a long time. I love you guys. I'm going to pray real quick. I'll let Pastor, you want to close? He wants me to close. Lord, I love you. I thank you. I'm so grateful this morning for the opportunity to talk about being a daddy. Lord, as much as I can glean from your word and try to be a good dad, Lord, you are the perfect example of being a father. Let me to hear those words. Let those words to ring in my mind forevermore, recognizing that it's you that's the ultimate example, not me. So let me submit my life to you so that my children will understand what it means to submit their lives to you. Let me to live my life in such a way that's integrous and righteous so that they too will be integrous and righteous because that's what I want for my kids, to be a success in everything they do. Not because I gave them everything, but because they learned what it meant to be a believer in Christ and what it meant to be insulated, not isolated. That we would be salt and light everywhere we go because you were salt and light everywhere you went. Let us to remember your example 
and led us to live our lives in such a way that we exemplify you. As you said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Lord, let me, at the end of my life, let me be able to say the same thing. That if you've seen me, J.J., Josh, and Naya, then you've seen the Father. That of your lives, that your children will be able to say, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. Because I'm in tune with you, I'm in touch with you, and I'm listening to who you are. I love you, Father. I ask that you would just bless every man in here. Overflow their lives. Let success find them in everything they do. Let meaningfulness find them in everything they do because it means something. I love you, Lord. I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.